Now, you have been very busy in the meanwhile. I know you have a whole set of your books have been published. I want you to tell us all about it. There's an ample opportunity here. I want you to explain to us what you've been doing, what you've got now, and, and why everyone should be looking at your books. Wow. So these are the, this is the box set, right? And the um, S that we've used, which is uh, showing through the front of the books as well, that's the um, signet ring of the Holy Roman Emperor Germanic. So they're all um, they're all hardcover books, and uh, they're all full color throughout. There's about so this is this is a five volume set on the Hidden yeah. King of England. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, twelve hundred pages and uh, over seven hundred photos. So tell it, it us, took tell us, tell four us, years. Tell us. It, took, it, took, it took four years, right? And I needed to prove um, the origin of kingship because uh, the British and European royal families claim that their kingship stems from Jesus, right? And then religion tells us that Jesus died on the cross when he was like 33 and like AD 33 and he never married, he had no children. But... Um, Historical documents and the um, high order secret society documents show that um, Jesus survived the crucifixion and married and had children. And also that there were two Jesuses. Oh, tell us more. This is reminiscent of the two Oswalds, Greg. You've no doubt heard of that theory. Advanced by John Armstrong, that there were two persons living relatively parallel lives who had mothers by the same name, to whom he refers as Harvey and Lee, respectively, who the CIA used, you know, trading off for different roles here in, in setting up the assassination of JFK and framing one of them for the event. Uh, yeah, well, you know, Jesus was really framed, wasn't he? Tell us, tell us about Jesus, the two Jesus. Well, um, Queen Victoria spent a million pounds in her time on her genealogy, and it dated back to Jesus and another Jesus who were third cousins. They were actually second cousins, but it was one generation removed. So they had the same... Uh, great, great grandparents. Um, and one Jesus went to England and another Jesus went to the Algarve in Portugal and this cave is uh, in the Algarve in Portugal. The Algarve is the whole south coast of Portugal. Uh, so I had, I spent four years um, discovering the origins of the true kingship of the United Kingdom. And I found that, uh, I, I found Jesus' graves. And so I um, had a nap in them, which was actually really nice. It was a really nice energy. It was, uh, it's called macrocosm, microcosm, where you feel at one with the, uh, yourself and the small, which is the five, as well as the macrocosm, which is the six. So these were places where there was um, a vortex of energy. And I found uh, 10 of these Jesus grave sites and they were backed up by the foundations of buildings, religious ceremonies still practiced today, and codification in literature, uh, film, statues, buildings, time bearing directions, the prime meridian, and uh, law, common law and, and civil law, statute law, as well as the Royal Courts of Justice and um, St. Paul's Cathedral in London. As, yeah, yeah, so, you know, it was, it was quite big. It was quite, it was quite uh, groundbreaking, you know. And uh, the biggest secret of the Catholic Church 
is that there are two Jesuses. And the Catholic Church knows this, knows that there were two Jesuses, and they consider it their best kept secret. And Pope Francis actually agrees with me that there are two Jesuses, or there were two Jesuses. Um, and um, when I was in Lisbon, having discovered some of the grave sites, his people were not only following us around and sitting in the same cafe and all wearing the same perfume, but they were also in the places already that we were going to in Lisbon. And when I got back to the hotel room, that same perfume was emanating out of the ensuite, which has got double, double glazed doors, which were closed and double shutters. So there's no way for the that perfume to get into the bathroom, but it was emanating out of the bathroom. So we were definitely being followed and located by Pope's people who were telling us through perfume that we were on the right track. This is utterly fascinating and startling, actually, Greg, I'm fascinated about the part of the Jesus who was crucified, having survived and married. Can you tell us more about that, who he married and so forth? Yeah, well, um, the French word for initiation is lancement. So the higher the initiation, the longer the lance. So Jesus was reportedly, figuratively, up on a cross, getting pierced by a very long lance, which suggests that it was a very high initiation. And I think that the initiation was this, that Jesus was from a royal lineage. He's based in Galilee, uh, just east of Jerusalem. And uh, he was too much trouble for the Romans in and around Jerusalem. So they gave him another kingdom. And that kingdom was the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which then had a combination of names as a series of small kingdoms. So he needed a reputation to precede him to go to England to set himself up as king. And this all was done with Roman compliance and Roman escort, with a lot of Romans looking the other way, including Pontius Pilate, etc. So Jesus gets to the southeast coast of England under um, Roman military and diplomatic escort. And that's actually proven and recorded in the murals on the Lord Mayor of London's carriage. And in the Lord Mayor of London's ceremonies today where the Romans have spears, long lances that they're poking at the Lord Mayor of London in like 2012, and the Lord Mayor of London is laughing at the spears or lances. So Jesus arrived in southeast England. He arrived up the Medway, which is the uh, tidal river going in south of the Thames. Jesus came to England. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of legends about it. The, um, the second national anthem of Britain. And, 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 of course, this is post after the crucifixion. Which didn't happen to either of the Jesuses. If there was a crucifixion, a physical death, then it happened to someone else, which may have been a lookalike, and some people suggest it was Judas. I'm not sure whether it even happened. Continue. Um, but he survived because he had a lineage, and that lineage claims to be the um, monarchs of the United Kingdom and of Europe. Um, so Jesus arrives up the Medway, which is a tidal river, and the Medway used to circle right round England. So the whole southeast coast of England was an island 
and then it was a tidal island, and then it was a spring tidal island, and then it silted up until in, uh, I think it was about 1955, it was dammed. And then in 1959 and again in 1969, uh, it flooded, the Midway flooded over the dam and up to the top point of the, of the, of the stream. And the top point of the stream is called Eden, and the near and there's Eden Bridge, which goes over the stream, as in Garden of Eden. And the um, the nearest local landmark is called Godstone. And the area was covered in uh, giant golden oaks. And where precisely is this located, Greg? Uh, it's it's near the intersection of uh, Surrey. Surrey. And Western East Sussex. Um, so he, he um, that area, the whole tidal island of the southeast of England, um, was called um, Regni. And Regni was kingdom come. Regni was where all of the exilarchs of the conquered kingdom were taken. So first of all, Jesus became king of Regni because his reputation preceded him, and he had such a good uh, lineage. And then he um, uh, took a walk along Pilgrim's Way. It's called Pilgrim's Way, and it's 44 miles to, um, to London to Southwark, right? Suffolk and Suffolk Cathedral. And Suffolk Cathedral... Marks, it's written Southwark, Suffolk. So Suffolk Cathedral marks where you walk south, Southwark, down Pilgrim's Way to Regni, to this kingdom of the Exilarchs, or Kingdom Come, in Eden at Godstone. <laughs> and then um, Jesus took the ferry across um, the Thames and started to develop um, London, which was then called uh, Trinovantum, um, which means splendid trinity. Um, and then uh, eventually the name was changed. He actually designed London. London was just a commune at the time. Um, and later in about 360 AD, it became a walled commune. But London was um, designed and built in the shape of a uh, lion, as in baby lion, as in Babylon, without the head, and Jesus was the head. And then he changed the name of London to, well, he changed the name of Trinovantum, Splendid Trinity, to uh, Londinium, which is a lion brood despicini Virgin Mary. So that formed London, VM, which became London. And then he became the mayor of London. And the mayor of London has all the roles of uh, the king within London and essentially within England. The mayor of London does all the work of the king and the king just sits back. And today the mayor of London does all the role of the king within England and the British Isles, and um, even does overseas trips. So Jesus became Lord Mayor of London, as in Jesus is Lord. And then Jesus became the King of England and the King of Scotland. And then the, uh, the Catholic Church broke away from Jesus' teachings in 451 AD, and in the same year, the Catholic Church sent the Saxons in to Great Britain to remove any evidence of Jesus and his teachings. So the Catholic Church actually excommunicated itself from Jesus' teachings, Jesus' lineage, and Jesus' history. And then there were a lot of authors, even up to like 1400 AD, who wrote as though they were writing in 800 AD 
and called themselves things like the Venerable Bede. And they were actually conspiracy writers. And their conspiracy writing was then taken as historical fact. And as a result, there's very little history in Great Britain prior to 451 AD. And there's very little history in Britain prior to 1066 when William the Conqueror came over. So Britain was um, essentially conquered and its history was wiped out and its culture was wiped out. So all the British really know about the history is uh, bits and pieces from 1066 AD. Um, so what I did was use documents from the mean William the Conqueror. Yeah. yeah. From the time of William the Conqueror. That's all they yeah. know of there. Yeah, 1066, and there's very little before that. So there were conquerors, there were a lot of conquerors successfully, successively that came over and destroyed the culture and history and artifacts of Britain. And there's a few that became uncovered from the uh, 1666 Great Fire of London, which uh, resulted in buildings, timber buildings being pulled down and then digging being done for the foundations of stone buildings. And that unearthed things like uh, an effigy of John Marcy, where John Marcy is the name of Jesus' firstborn son. I know you're not religious. No, it's fascinating. <laughs> it's fascinating, Greg. This is going to startle a huge percentage of the audience that, views this program, startle it. Yeah. Well, yeah, there, were, there were two Jesuses. Um, and so there was, there was Jesus of England or Jesus of Britain. And then there was Jesus of uh, the Algarve, which is the coastal southern state of uh, Portugal, which was its own kingdom. It used to be the kingdom of Portugal and the kingdom of the Algarves. So... Um, what I did was uh, look at Google Earth and um, and go. I need to go there, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I do as much research as I could on it. And the, the the research that you can do on the internet is blah. It's really just confusing. Go nowhere, blah. But when you get there and you live here and you talk to the locals and you find out local knowledge and you find out that <clears throat> in the Algarve there's three conflicting types of historian. There's the um, Miguelist Nazis, there's the Arabists, and there's the Christian Templars. And they've all got completely different versions. And on top of that... Um, uh, Portugal was under fascist control until 1974. So when the historians wrote things, they would codify it. And one of the, way, one of the ways they codified it is that if we had one page of information in a 100-page book, they would take four paragraphs out of that page and intersperse it a quarter way through, halfway through, and at the end of the book. So in order to find out what they were saying, you actually had to retype the book and reset the paragraphs to try and get some continuity to what they were saying. Right? So it was the, the historians in, in Portugal were doing massive obfuscation to save their bacon until 1974, which is similar to what happened to England until 1066. So on top of that, you have to read several books and talk to the three different types of historians and go to the site and take photographs and measurements to uh, ascertain whether what they were saying was true or it actually wasn't based on anything. Because when you got there and checked out their information, the physical site was so different from what they mentioned, it was absolutely worthless. <laughs> so... So in order to uh, get beyond that, you actually had to look at the Portuguese historian's information 
in the light of they were alluding to something but they definitely weren't saying it. And you had to look at what they were covering up and how they were covering up. So what I found through all of this obfuscation and the three different types of historians here, we quite like Nazis, Arabists and Christian Templars, um, was that the truth of the history in the Algarve was recorded in the buildings, especially in the foundations and the older buildings, and in the doorways. And often the doorways were moved within a building to allude to where Jesus' body had been moved to because his grave in the Algarve was moved largely due to earthquakes. And then when his body was located and it became a source of kingship, having the body of Jesus was a mark of kingship. So there are all sorts of invasions in Portugal from 1807 to 1834. Uh, there are three major wars here. And they're all after the remains of Jesus with the Algarve. So his body was moved. And I used the codification and how the doors were moved from the outside on the north side to the inside on the south side, etc., to find out where his next burial site was. And also looked at the literature with things like they had a random ceremony where they would put candles on the inside of windows in all of the houses to celebrate something. But if you do that, you can't see out, right? Which means that people outside can move a body down the street at night with some remains and no one can see out because it's winter, the windows are closed and the reflection from the light on the window means that all the windows are effectively blacked out. So that's the sort of thing that gives you the date on them moving. And on top of that, the Algarve is covered in uh, natural subterranean tunnels. So some of the movement was happening underground. Um, some of the uh, so-called Templar atrocities never happened because the Arabs escaped down wells underground and walked underground for eight kilometres and escaped. Um, yeah, so it took it took a while, and then right at the end on Easter Friday, I found that the uh, in Sylves, the ceremony on Easter Friday where they carry uh, a vertical Joseph of Arimathea, a vertical Mary or Virgin Mary, and a horizontal Jesus in a coffin. That the way the coffin was presented was exactly the same way that I found his original gravesite. Um, and um, the pathway they took, I mapped that out on Google Earth and it was uh, a direct allusion to the knowledge he had dating back to Babylon. Have you been able to trace a genealogy from Jesus forward? Uh, um, what well, post? Uh, well, Queen Victoria did it, right? And post uh, publishing the books, um, I have um, begun and uh, could be part of the next book. I found the, that that um, Jesus of the Algarve's grandson was Emperor Caesar Trajan. And Emperor Caesar, Caesar Trajan adopted his nephew Hadrian, who was the great-grandson of Jesus of the Algarve. And um, Emperor Hadrian adopted Antonio Pius, Emperor Caesar Antonio Pius, and he was the great-grandson of Jesus of England. And Antonio Pius had a daughter, and his daughter married uh, uh, Caesar Marcus Aurelius, and his son, his biological son, was Emperor Commodus. 
So um, Commodus uh, was the lineage of Jesus of England and Jesus of the Elgo. <laughs> this is all so extraordinary, Greg. Do the, do the Windsors therefore claim that they can trace their genealogy back to one or the other of the two Jesus? Well, the thing about the Windsors is that they're uh, illegitimate, um, biologically illegitimate and uh, bigamously born. And they have been since 1840. So they're really just a write-off family. They're a bunch of uh, commoners usurping as royals. Uh, who actually hadn't been crowned, and in their crowning, they hadn't de declared their true names. 